Hello and welcome back for another episode of Write America. This literary series was dreamed up by author Roger Rosenblatt in an effort to bridge the great divide in our country through readings and conversations from award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers. My name is Lauren and I will be your host for the evening. If you're not familiar with us, Book Review is Long Island's largest independent bookstore located in Huntington Village. We have a great episode in store for you tonight featuring readings from writers Ursula Hege and Vanessa Cutie. If you missed last week's episode with Vijay Shesadri and Kaylee Jones or any of the previous episodes of Write America for that matter, you can go to Book Review's Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also going to be recorded, so if you happen to miss something, you can always go back and watch the episode again. Now, before we get started with the readings, there's just a couple of things that I would like to uh, tell you about Crowdcast so that you know how the event will run tonight. Um, first of all, <clears throat> there is a blue button right beneath the stream here. Uh, if you click that button, it will bring you to bookreview.com where you can purchase signed uh, copies of the author's books. Um, there is also a button down here that says ask a question. If you have a question that comes up um, for Ursula or uh, Vanessa during the event, you can just click ask a question and submit it for the Q&A which we'll get to at the end of the event. Um, and of course, there is the chat. I see that some of you are making um, comments in there. So please continue to do so. Talk about the event, talk about the readings, ask questions, and of course, drop your emoji applause so that we know that uh, you like what you're hearing. Uh, so without further ado, we are going to get started. Uh, so our first reader tonight is Vanessa Cutie. Vanessa's fiction has appeared or is forthcoming in the Best American Short Stories 2021, the Kenyon Review, uh, West Branch, Indiana Review, uh, the Cincinnati Review, Shenandoah, The Rumpus, and others. She's received her MFA from Stony Brook University and lives in the suburbs of New York. So please welcome to the screen, Vanessa Cutie. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, good. So glad you could be here with us tonight. Uh, please take it away. Uh, okay, I'm going to read um, my short story, Our Children, which uh, appeared in West Branch last year. I was once married to a man. He was tall and burly with huge, heavy hands and too many calluses to count. Peter. Weekends, he worked on vintage sports cars for fun. He lifted weights in our home gym, blasting Journey or the Ramones or best of classical mixes. He sometimes did this naked. I'd accidentally catch him, but then stay to watch, pressing myself flat on the outside of the door, peeking while he posed and flexed and turned to get a good look at himself. He kissed his fingers in front of food. He used pet names for me. Baby Pie was one. TT, Legs, Little Doe, short for Donut. Donut hole, he later explained during an argument. You follow? He said, making sure I was properly insulted. I thought this was normal. Peter made his money in construction, licked his lips a lot. I didn't know what marriage was supposed to be. I had no idea what I was expecting. We had two children together, and they both look vaguely of him, but I love them regardless, and that's what's important. I met Dan at the grocery store. When I went for a plastic bag, he was just right there watching. Things I noticed, a chipped or strangely shaped cuspid, the pleat in the front of his suit pants. I must have looked down, blushing. It's something that happens to me. There is no way to ignore him. It would not have been polite. Later, I thought to ask him why he was doing his own grocery shopping. Where is your wife or your housekeeper? This, after I knew more about him. But by then it was pointless inconsequential. Everything that was to happen had already begun to happen. Peter was easy. Let go of me just like that. Said okay to the money, the house, whichever of the cars I wanted. He must have had something else cooking by then. I refused to believe he just hated me that much. He called Dan lover boy in our emails with lawyers. He said he wanted custody split right in half. He moved to a three-bedroom condo on the water. A magical tower, our daughter called it for the longest time. Every other weekend, our house swelled with them, a new population. They congregated, they organized, they became fresh in the breakfast nook when I said we had pancakes but not waffles. They sat for hours in the living room, bare feet, leaving heat marks on the glass of the coffee table, juice pooling, crumbs everywhere you could imagine. 
They hooted at the chug of machine guns and grenades in the games they played. I knew they pointed their controllers at my back when I turned to walk out, arms full of plates, crumpled napkins. Anything else, guys? I asked over my shoulder anyway. When I sliced a thumb cutting strawberries for their Sundays and screamed, darn it, they chuckled under their breaths. What, you think I won't say fuck, I said, getting in their faces? Fuck, I said, cupping the blood. I let some drip onto the table, into the sprinkles. Fuck these sprinkles too. I upended the bowl. They stared. That got them. They were seven, seven, six, five, three eldest boys, the youngest by eight months, the girl. When they left, when the house was empty again, even the fabric of the area rugs became cooler to the touch. I heard the high frequency hum of electronics and the tumble of the dryer, the soft lap, lap of hand towels one onto the other floors down. I stood in the doorway to the living room and it appeared to me as a glacier, cold and empty and white. Dan's wife was basically just me with brown hair. She stayed in his five bedroom federal colonial across town and drove the SUV he paid for. She hosted wine nights on his dime and cried to her guests, mothers of children who went to school with my children. In random text messages, she needled him about leaving her. Hope it was worth it, she wrote a lot, tearing our family apart. Then she wised up and started writing your family, tearing your family apart. She changed the verb here and there. She was splitting, ripping, breaking. Once she wrote exploding and it evoked something and I was impressed for a second at least. Why couldn't we have met before everything? I said to Dan in bed one night when we were young. He was still inside. He liked when I was wistful, I think. I felt a change. Tell me about when you were young. His face was buried somewhere near my shoulder. I had to guess if this is what he said. I was a cheerleader, I said. Lie. I was on your book. I wore glasses and twirled my ponytail with a pencil and sat on the edge of the teacher's desk. I got in trouble for being mean, I said, and let it pout change my voice. I stole another girl's boyfriend and I made her cry in the bathroom. Jesus, he said, rearing. I did sometimes wonder, wish, that we had met when we were young, before everything, before we made our lives. But the children, your children, something always chided. This thing that chided, by the way, was not my best self, not my voice. It was choral, all altos, the moan of disappointed mothers. Then you would not have your beautiful children, the mother said. And this is true. But I would have made and met other children. I would have loved these other children just the same because I am capable of so much love. Dan's wife liked to fuck us. Late changes to the dates of his weekends, taking one of their kids instead of both, conjuring appointments and meetings that she expected us to believe. More than once, we had to cancel plans. Deep breath, Dan said one of these nights. She had just dropped them off. We'll make another plan. I swear his son, one of the sons, eyed me from behind him, his big, glassy pupils celebrating. On this night, I had had it. I slammed and smashed so many things in our bathroom. I came downstairs, changed, sat on the bottom step, tying and retying a sneaker, waiting for him to see. So, I said, when his shadow finally darkened me, I'm going for a run, need to let off some steam. This is insane. Okay, sweets, he said. I heard loud cartoon music from the living room. His socks were pilled and too fuzzy. The way he stood, I saw a gut. All decency had gone out the window. But it's not, not, but it's actually not okay. I stood up and pushed past him, my shoulder into his chest. And usually he would grab me somewhere, my hand, my elbow, the back of my neck, if it was like that, a handful of hair even. He let me, ha he let me pass. I did run sometimes, so it was believable. But that night I walked to Dan's old house. Of course her car was there. Same suburban as mine, same midnight package even. Inside, she was on her couch, feet on an ottoman. I thought to knock on the door, start something. Why not? Why the hell not? But I didn't. 
I just watched her and judged her and savored the taste of that judgment. Peter? Peter was still Peter. Should I have stayed with you, Peter? I thought when he came to pick up our children. Then there would be only two of them and two of us, and we would not be outnumbered. He looked fitter, different clothes. He patted me on the back when I walked them to the car, like we were old chums, classmates, colleagues. He didn't spring the kids on us to punish me. He loved our children and looked forward to them and greeted them with zest and his real smile. And this made me feel very, very guilty. We made a plan, something fun for me and Dan, the kids, a weekend in the woods, a stream, a cabin, a tame campfire out front, its very top spinning a line of black into the evening sky, the sunset. We'll be on one side of the house, they'll be on the other, Dan said, showing me with his hands how much room we'd have. It's a beautiful place, you'll love it. He said the last part like he actually believed it. It was sweet to watch them pack their things, what they thought they'd need. My two wouldn't leave for a day, nevertheless, a weekend without books. Three apiece, weighing down their backpacks. The other two brought handheld video games and charger cables, disconnected phones that they could use with Wi-Fi. What can I say? They are not mine. Nothing about them is from me. Wait, I said in the front hallway. The kids, their luggage sitting around my feet like an audience. Does everyone have a toothbrush? I watched them all run back up and thought, this is going to be a lovely time. We are going to make a memory with our children that we will cherish forever. I'm going to be calm and easy and light. I pictured myself on a glacier, the sun warming my front, my back cool and wet, quiet everywhere. The cabin was smaller than I'd imagined, but it was far from the road and a stream ran right by it and round white rocks lined its base like the fruit gemmed hedge of a gingerbread house. I could stand in its kitchen, stirring cocoa, looking out the window at the expanse of land, the thick weave of the woods, the mountains behind everything. It was true. I did feel calm. I felt just fine. But it turns out there was no Wi-Fi and Dan's kids were livid. Let's run them ragged, Dan said. I'll play with them outside and they'll be so tired they'll collapse. He had his hand in a baseball glove and punched its palm with the other fist. You go inside, get ready for me. I rolled my eyes at his wink and turned away, but I tried to walk back to the house as sexily as I could. It was not easy. The ground was uneven with rocks and roots. I couldn't roll my hips. A chipmunk, unafraid, darted just in front of my foot. Behind me, I heard them screaming, the thwack of a ball, the sound of the wind moving over its stitches. And he was right. They passed out before I was able even to feed them. We left them all where they were. I covered them with blankets. His two on the larger couch, foot to foot, one of mine on each armchair. I looked at their dirty little faces, the way the dried sweat stuck their hair to the heads, their heads. Across the house moments later, Dan held a hand over my mouth to keep me quiet and I was relieved. For the first time in a long time, it felt like the beginning again. But when I woke up in the night, something had happened. It was that black tail of smoke from the fire. It was the rot from between the beams and the walls seeping. It was that chipmunk being eaten limb by limb by a raccoon under the deck. I heard the chew and crunch. I didn't know what to do. I lifted my hands to brush back my hair, but they were heavy, too heavy, laden with hate, anger, sleep, something. I sat up, slow, slow, a puppet waking, someone's hand in my back. I heard Dan breathing. I didn't crane to see his face. My movement would wake him. It could have been anyone, anything lying there. Oh, I said out loud. It was smooth and deep and greasy, this voice. It was not me, and it was not the mother's chiding me. It was a dawning, it was a crack. Dan, I said, and put my hand on the being next to me. What is it, Dan said, jumping awake, what? He sat up, looked around, the whites of his eyes darting, leaving streaks in my slow vision. Dan, I said, and pat him, once, twice, three times in the space between his shoulders. My hand tapped like something mechanical. He didn't feel warm to the touch. Oh, I said again, because the sludge inside me was beginning to thin and redden. 
I imagined effervescence. I imagined light and heat and a great sound booming. We have to leave these children here. What, he said, and the white shrunk as he squinted and the change in his voice told me he was cocking his head. Jesus, what? You had a dream, go back to sleep. I may have had a dream that pointed me in that direction. That's how it might have gotten in. His hand found its way up the front of my t-shirt. He tried to push me back. No, we do. We have to leave them here, I said. Not forever. Maybe we come back for them when they've grown a little, found their way. Do you understand what our lives will be like? This voice was a marvel. It would have sickened anyone. Maybe he had dreamt the same thing at the same time or just after I did. The character in our minds miming deeds, synchronous. Maybe it, whatever it was had started in on him too, because minutes later he sat up, slow like I had. He sighed like he was waking up for a work day, and he moved his legs over the side of the bed and started to pull his pants on. It might have been any number of things, but I think it was the rot. We drove home with the windows open, August air coming in, the stereo on. The road was damp, the grass at its median, already dewed and glittering in our headlights, the moon, the sky, the smell of honeysuckle when he dipped too close to the shoulder. I wanted to say something about the stars and the night, how lucky we were. He wanted to say something too. I could see it, but we both knew what not to do to a good thing. We drank wine at the table, smoked a bowl, made no move to hide either, shed our clothes in the kitchen, moved to the marble floor of the foyer, then went into the shower and did it there. We brought the wine bottle with us. It sloshed as we moved, spilling into the water we were sitting under. We were sitting at that point. We stoked each other, lubed and scrubbed, and then gave up and got out. Went to the bathroom, leaving wet footprints, puddles and drips across the carpet and wood. Our hair soaked our pillows and we warmed quickly. We did not touch, but we fell asleep separately, each breathing with a heaviness and a peace that had been at that point unknown to us. I did not dream at all of our children. I awoke well before dawn and I envisioned them. I knew what they were going to do, their future. They would awaken and start to work, make paint from the juice of wild blueberries, use it to dye linens and tiny frocks for the littlest one. They would make these frocks, a loom, a needle and thread. They would weave mats from gr grasses they collected by the stream. Char fish and rodents over that very same campfire. They would ransack the kitchen. Try on for size the shoes found in the closets, the shirts and the luggage I had left in our haste to get away. They would belt those shirts around their waists using tails from pelts of animals. A band of them, these children in size order, marching across that expanse, hands on hips, singing a song they made up. It would be warm. Even in the mountains, it would be warm. The night had been warm. The day would be hot. There was electricity and food. They would be so busy. They would grow. Because of left alone and let to live, all things grow. The three boys have fashioned tools from sticks and rocks. They sharpen stones on other stones and affix them with rope. At first they ah at the sparks flying blue and orange. Then they get back to their work. They find an ax in the garage and a BB gun. They smear their faces with dirt and lie in their fronts waiting for the rustle of a buck in the thicket. Soon they see one. No, a doe. Sight her big black eyes and hear her breath, breath as if she's only inches away. Those eyes, they think. The hooves and tail. The eldest takes it down with an arrow. Magic shot. Magic. A set they also found in the garage. The eldest wears a bandana around his head, red and knotted in the back. He's a pack leader. He runs to the deer and waits for it to die, watching blood pulse from the wound. Things die so slowly, he thinks. He is seven, and it takes much longer than the deaths in his game, where bodies fall and then disappear seconds later. So they leave the deer to die. They catch on the big lawn while the thing heaves its last breaths a hundred feet away. The girl, during all of this, the girl, mine, has stayed in the house. She's pointing her way through a picture book. She is reaching for the second shelf of the fridge for a piece of plastic wrapped cheese, but she can't reach, so she gives up and takes a small cupcake she finds on the counter, last from a box of a hardening dozen. Lucky. 
The eldest and the second eldest try to drag the dead thing back onto the expanse so they can prepare it. But it's too heavy, more than 100 pounds, the weight of all these children and then some. So the two send the third back to the house, tell him to watch the girl, tell him he shouldn't see this, that they are seven and he is only six and he is not mature enough to see this, any of this, all of this. He cries his way back to the house, swearing he hates the two, that he'll never play with them again. He kicks the baseball they were all playing with the day before, hopes it rolls into a gully or a gulch or the stream at least, so he, so no one has the pleasure of it again. Its skin is so thick, it takes a few passes, but the tools they made are decent, would impress an adult, and the white of the belly, slit over and over, finally gives. An amateur cut, but it gives. Blood, more blood, the shining bend of an intestine, the puffed white of something else. A stomach, maybe. They don't know. But there are flies starting to buzz. And then they are afraid of eating the wrong thing, of getting sick and dying. The eldest calls it off and starts to walk away, but the other one stays behind for a minute. We killed her for no reason, he thinks. He could cry. If he starts crying, who's to say when it will stop? So then he thinks, things die for no reason all the time. And he picks up a rock and smashes the doe's mouth. He takes a small front tooth that he knocks loose. He rubs it between his fingers and puts it in his pocket before he runs to meet the others. They teach the girl to read. They allot two hours a day for the studying of something, all of them. They estimate birthdays and they celebrate with singing and games. They learn to cook, mend, make beds, become adults. When the girl is of a natural reproductive age, she pairs up with the eldest boy, who is, after all, unrelated to her. They wed, a ceremony in a clearing, flower crowns, a sunny day, a cake they make from woodland berries. They mate like bobcats on a flat rock in the sun, or like humans in a room of the cabin, door locked. They have a child, a son. They name him something earthy, leaf, stone, birch, blue. They name him something familial, Dan. I sucked down the smell of the same honeysuckle patch as they went back up. I prepared to stop when I passed the trooper. I was doing 80, 85. He must have been sleeping, though, because he never came up behind me. It was just before dawn when I turned into the cabin's drive. I went slow, afraid to make noise. The gravel, the pop of a branch. The lights were off. The front door and storm door shut. All windows on the front of the house down. I could hear the hum of the central air conditioning. The door was locked, but there was a key under the mat and it opened quietly enough. And then I was inside. The counter was wiped clean, still stacked with snacks, juice packs, bags and bags of chips, cupcakes, paper napkins. I put my keys down and went in toward the living room. And that's when I could smell their bodies. Hot, sweet, sleeping children have a smell especially when there are several of them together in one room. They hadn't moved much. The blanket kicked off the two boys on the couch. I fixed it. I found my son, brushed his hair back from his face. His forehead was cool, cooler than what you would expect for a living thing. But he breathed and breathed, and I could almost feel him ticking under my palm. My daughter was curled up, small enough to fit on the seat of the armchair a kitten, a mouse. She was silent and clean and young and unharmed. I sat on the floor in the middle of them, my back against the coffee table. I watched the sun come up and turn the walls blue, then pink, then gold, then dim down to the normal light of day. When they began to stir, when sleep had run its course, I stood up and went to the kitchen. I wanted them to find me there, bent in half over a cup of coffee, worrying at a crossword, the tails of my robe dragging on the floor. I had forgotten my robe, but I was still in pajamas and everything else would be right. I would look like a mother. One of his sons was the first to come in. Good morning, sweetheart, I said. He was rubbing his eyes. Can I make you something to eat? Okay, he said and sat. A bagel maybe, or cereal? He picked up his handheld video game. Thank you, he said without looking up from it. The rest wandered in one at a time. I fed them. I asked them to finish their milk, almond milk for Dan's. I said yes when they asked if they could change and play outside. 
I washed the dishes by hand. I folded the blankets, smacked the couch cushions flat, made the bed Dan and I had left during the night. And then I watched out the window. I watched the sun on their hair as they ran laughing. I watched the wind catch the hems of their shirts and the dirt come off their shoes. I watched them fall and roll and push each other and yell and cry and stop and get up again. I watched the sun get higher and higher in the sky. And when it was time, I opened the door and stood on the porch and I called to them. Thank you. Beautiful, loved it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we will um, see you back at the end for the conversation. So hang tight, Vanessa. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have a reading from Ursula Hagee. Ursula is the author of several novels, works of nonfiction, and collections of short stories. She teaches writing at Stony Brook Southampton campus and is the recipient of more than 30 grants and awards. Please welcome to the screen, Ursula Hagee. Hi, Ursula. Hi. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, I loved what you read. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but uh, the building suspense and the um, fantasy moving into present tense, um, I was totally caught up in it. Um, I'll read to you from my most uh, recent book called um, the patron saint of pregnant girls. And um, the paperback just came out. It, it, it was a weird time to publish uh, because everything was at a, at a lower volume in a way. And so I'm appreciating coming back and uh, reading to you. Uh, the year is <clears throat> 1878. And I'm starting with the first chapter. A hundred year wave. With each pregnancy, Lotte and the toy maker introduced their unborn to the sea. Lotte with her belly taut, color with his hands on her hips as he guides her into the peak of her belly. Eyes shut with bliss, with reverie. Lotte feels her baby swim the ball of her body separating it from the Nordsee. First Hannelore, then Martin, then Berbo. During her fourth pregnancy, Lotte gets playful and dives into a handstand, surprises herself and the toy maker who laughs aloud, <clears throat> faced with her feet wiggling above the surface of the sea. But as he reaches down to steady her, one hand on her belly, the other on her buttocks. He's the one who needs steadying because Laura shoots up, Lotte shoots up, spews water at him, clamps her legs around his middle, tilts herself to him. When you grow up by the edge of the Nordsee, you respect it, know it like the rise and fall of your breath. It begins when you learn to swim before you can walk. Plunge below a wave and dig your tiny fingers into the silt before a wave can scramble you. Hanalore is staring that way. Exuberant in the water like her mother, Lotte, while Martin is cautious. Too early to know with Balbo, who's two, that August of 1878, when a freak wave heaves itself at Nordstrand. A hundred year wave, the old women say. Not that Lotte Janssen miscalculated the tides. Vacationers may drown, foolish enough to walk out too far on the wet sand and get cut off by the surge of incoming tide. If locals die by water, it's in a storm or when a fishing boat capsizes. This hundred year wave will enter legend define Nordstrand as much as the people who tell and retell the story, who consider themselves witnesses, not only those who see Lotte and her children dance and play in the tidal shallows on their way home after the circus performance, but others who'll hear about it later 
and yet speak as if they were with Lotte just before all wind ceases and the sky fades from blue to yellow, blotting the sun. In these stories, memories, the old women insist. Lotte carries her fourth baby, Wilhelm, on one hip. Her daughters wear smocked dresses and Martin his lederhosen as they chase the retreating tide, laughing, running back ashore and out again until Lotta offers her free hand to link her children to each other and to her. Free hand, the old women will ask. How free can a mother's hand be if she has children hanging from it? But you refuse to envision your own children ripped from you, your grandchildren, allowed to wonder why God has punished Lotte and Kalle Janssen without mercy because they copulated before marriage, but then you'd all be going under with sin. Let's put our feet in the water, Lotte sings to her children. This is the sun's water. Who of you hasn't let the sun's water lick your ankles, your calves. You know what that's like. You also know what it's like to go under while you play in the Nordsee as children or swim out far as adults. And you give your memories to Lotte Janssen as you describe how the wave slams into her, fills her mouth and her nose, stings her eyes. And in that one moment, all you see and recall and imagine fuses, poised to grow, and enter legend. Legends, the old women know, are ancient gossip. Yet not all gossip leads to legends. By itself, gossip won't last, but legends feed on gossip. The old women know if you have a hangnail, if your great-great-grandparents cheated on each other, if you burn your soup, if you carry hate in your dreams. After the freak waves, recedes, people fan across the butt to search for the children. Nuns and circus people and toy makers and fishermen and shopkeepers and church people and old women and farmers and blacksmiths and big bellied girls with a capital G always. Big bellied girls from the St. Margaret home for pregnant girls. A bizarre crowd hoping to outwit death. Some on circus ponies or horses, water sloshing around the hooves, some in carriages, most on foot. We'll find them, Kalle vows to Lotte, who clutches the youngest against her shoulder. We taught them to swim before they could walk. I'm going to skip um, about a page and a half and um, <clears throat> Tilly. 11 years old, cradling her belly with linked palms. She's out on the tidal flats among church people who usually shun St. Margaret girls and how they flaunt their bodies. Church people know to postpone rapture because only then will rapture be theirs in heaven, a rapture far superior to what mortals can feel. And it infuriates them that these girls have indulged in the act that is sacred after the sake in the act that is sacred after the sacrament of matrimony, but a sin before. A few even managed to snag local men. Yet the search for the Janssen children makes them allies. They have the sun in their eyes, and the sun is hot and slants, almost like sun in the morning, that angle, except from the opposite direction, and they shout the names of the children. They shout Babel. They shout Martin, they shout Hannelore. All Tilly wants is to lie down. When she awoke with slow cramps at dawn, she didn't tell Sister Francisca. Later, Tilly thinks, I'll tell Sister later. She was determined to go to the circus gratis, as promised by the 24-hour man who appeared three days before. Um, the 24-hour man puts up posters for the circus and the circus stays for a week and it's a it's an annual thing and people expect it and look forward to it. And some of the men dream of leaving with the circus. 
<clears throat> Out on the tidal flats, Lotte Janssen kisses the top of Wilhelm's head and beseeches God to tell her what she's done wrong. Because if there's a reason you took them, my children took them, there must be something I can do to get them back from you. But God, he's silent, as silent as the darkening shapes of the boats on the sea. And when the boats return without her children and her husband steps ashore, it's up to her to bother with God. She draws the cross where she knows Wilhelm's heart to be, kisses his lips and his belly, whispers, forgive me, forgive me, against his damp skin, he coos, pats her cheeks, oh, and she, howling, howling and praying and howling and praying, casts him into the sea, take him, God, in return for my other three. The crowd pitches forward as if one body, but gives way to color, who hauls his last born from the sea, reclaims his son who smells of salt and water, of salt and earth. When he refuses to hand Wilhelm to his wife, people speculate he'll never forgive her. But the old women understand the measure of Lotta's sacrifice, understand the courage it takes to offer your child to God, understand they've witnessed the collapse of her faith. They know what that's like. Not everyone finds the path back to God. I'm skipping a few more pages. Tilly has been taken back to the St. Margaret home. Um, her labor is strong. Uh, the couple, so eager to adopt Tilly's baby, rush to the St. Margaret home, but must wait outside the infirmary. A very hard labor, Sister Francisca whispers, because Tilly is still a child herself. Her Lemley groans, and if she can't, Kaiserschnitt, cut her open for Lemley cries, it may not be necessary. I have to see Tilly, says for Lemley. Um, those two wait outside the room where Tilly is in labor. Um, Tilly remembers at one point they said, yours is one of the lucky babies already chosen before birth because you have good posture and good sense. Uh, the labor, the labor pains increase. Um, the pain again, a spooked horse and a white blinding ruckus that slams you to the ground. I wish I could suffer this pain for you, Tilly, for Lamla cries. That's when Tilly knows the woman is crazy or lying because no one saying chooses to ride your pain that rears up like a spooked horse and lets you crawl into your exhaustion before it rears up with you again and again till a rag on your nose, your mouth, nasty, nasty, spins you into disgust and fury, spins you, spins, and in that twilight of retching and spinning, one fist, one empty fist, empty, clenches your insides with each eve, and the taste is nasty as the smell retching from the empty. All St. Margaret girls have been forewarned to not see their newborns, but when Tilly pummels her breasts and howls till she can't breathe, Sister Francisca brings a red-fisted baby wrapped in white. When did that happen? When? If you promise to calm yourself, I'll let you hold her. Her. As if the two of us were not enough, Alfred. There has to be a third, a girl. You're very brave, Tilly. Sister Francisca wishes she could do so much more for her girls. First, teach them to prevent pregnancy. 
and then not wound them again by taking their babies away still. It would be worse for a baby to be raised by such a young mother. Sister Francisca understands about succumbing to the urgency of her body, to passion and to shame, understands about being banned from her newborn, 41 years since Tilly gulps and sniffles and lifts her arms to her baby, to the sweet weight, oh, but the generations are all mixed up. How can my own girl look like the Lamleys? We will raise your child with love, they had promised. But Tilly knows once she lets go, they'll take her own girl and not return. If only my baby had a club foot, a club foot and a hair lip, then the Lamleys won't want her. Tilly holds on to her own girl, who wiggles her tiny body against her, roots about, bumps one cheek into Tilly's collarbone. Tilly pulls her lower against her breast, but sister cups the baby's head gently, guiding the rooting mouth away from Tilly. Girls who give away their babies for adoption right after birth don't get a nurse. Still, their breasts make milk that distends them. Some get blocked milk dud. <clears throat> Some get blocked milk dud. Milk ducts. Some get blocked milk ducts. Sister Francisca is meticulous when she binds their breasts. Some homes won't bind unmarried girls, let them suffer for their sins. Like the home in Bonn 41 years ago, sister has never spoken of her son, not even in confession. Yet she holds him with every newborn who passes through her hands. That swirl of hair on the back of his neck, that tiny pucker of lips, eyes ancient and wise, imprinting her on his memory, only to release him anew with grace. This path toward grace exhilarates San Sister Francisca with depth of faith she couldn't have imagined in her prayers when he was taken from her. Thank you. Hey. You know what I really loved? Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay. Um, imagining the children's lives for years and years and years. Um, imagining how they will survive out there. They'll learn to sew. They will, um, the specifics of what they will do to survive. And you do that in the present tense, which um, which makes it even more real, uh, because quite often um, what we imagine will always happen, and it happens in the present tense. So I really was drawn in. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I think it's interesting that um, bo the, both, you know, what we both read was about motherhood um, in such different kind of ways. Um, for me, I feel like that's one of the, you know, like they always say that you kind of keep writing the same story in a different way. And I feel like that's something I keep coming back to, um, like the idea of motherhood or what it means for us now. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something that you, you know, that you find yourself to keep coming back to or? Well, um, after I, it's certain, it certainly is there, you know, but after um, I had written five, six books, I was giving a reading and one of the people in the audience said, do you know, no, why? She said, why do you have a dead mother in every one of your books? And I said, I don't. <laughs> and uh, she sighed here and there. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I do. And the book I was working on at the time was said about a hundred years ago. And on the first page, the three wives of the Dutchman die. I mean, it's the first page, okay? So I really, of course, had to become aware of that. Um, I watched my mother die when I was 13. And that has shaped me in, in so many ways, has shaped me as much as coming um, from Germany, from a country that uh, I wanted to get away from. Um, it has 
sort of drawn my writing in that direction, I've written a lot about the Holocaust. And I've written a lot about uh, not having a mother. So you said for you, it, it keeps coming back in, in a similar form where the children are little and the woman is very detached in a way. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just, I guess I keep coming back to, I guess I keep like brushing up against, you know, what the expectations of motherhood are, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think as much as everything else <clears throat> changes, in the world, there are still these expectations of what a mother should be, and there's yes. if there's any if there's anything that a mother can't be, it's sort of ambivalent, right? Or like, yeah, regretful, or who knows, you know? And I just sort of yeah think that you know, just because you become a mother doesn't mean you stop being a you know a person who has maybe conflicting thoughts, or I don't know. It's just something that yeah. fascinates me. Yeah. Do you have any experience with having children around you? Yeah, well, I have. I have a son. Um, he's eight, mm -hmm. so um, I think that definitely, you know, that's obviously influenced <clears throat> it. Um, yes. I just, yeah. you know, it's. I think it's definitely. You see, I see a lot more now about like mom rage, and and it's becoming a little bit more acceptable for for mothers to kind of. <clears throat> at least talk about the experience of motherhood in a more truthful or honest way. But I think that mm -hmm. there's still this kind of shadowy side of it that we don't, you know, we don't really talk about a lot, which is just, it's sort of fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. It's a very courageous story that you read. It definitely does not fit into what many readers, many people think about when they think about a mother. Um, you, you take us into a very uh, fascinating part of her life. Did, did it feel like it was a courageous story, Vanessa? You know, I just think when you think of like, when people say, what's the worst thing a mother can do? It's leaving her children, right? And, yeah. you know, I feel like there are mothers who do that all the time and they're, it's not an easy decision. It's not like they say, I'm going to pack up and leave. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that probably a lot of mothers have felt before mm -hmm. that they want to, you know, up and leave their children. Um, and I, I don't know. I just, <clears throat> something about the idea of it being such a flippant and sort of easy decision to get in the car and leave all these children in this remote sort of fairy tale house is just, I don't know. I don't think it felt courageous. I think there was something really, you know, really realistic in that. I think a lot of mothers probably sometimes daydream <clears throat> about just upping and leaving their life, even if they don't say it out loud. A lot of people don't say a lot of things aloud, yeah. yeah. In my first novel, um, I wrote about a young writer by the name of Ursula, but it was fiction, and it's called Intrusions, and it's about the intrusions of her children into her writing life, the intrusion of her students, the intrusions of her characters, the intrusions of the children's father, um, lots of intrusions. And, um, and it was really, a lot of thinking too in how, especially for us as writers, being a mother um, changes things. In some ways I felt I, um, there were, I mean, I adored having kids. I loved getting all the details from them just by observing them. But there was also um, definitely the effort of holding on to who I was. You know, I always feel I was born with the writing inside of me, like a first child, like a pre-child. And, um, and that was there. And I was a writer right from the beginning. And um, to not let go of that, to make it easier, uh, was a struggle, was a struggle. 
and um, yeah. Yeah, it's like you're almost allowed to um, to push back on, you know, if you're if you have a partner and your partner intrudes, or if you have, you know, students and your students intrude, it's sort of expected for you to be able to push back against that if you're a creative, right? The one thing yeah. I think people don't expect you to push back on is if your children intrude, um, mm -hmm. what what they do, and you know, of course, more than anyone else, yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's a, it's a juggling act, I think. Uh, hey, Lauren. Hi, um, hi. Go ahead, continue. No, I was saying it's, it's a juggling act, especially with small children. And if we have a profession that we feel strongly about, you know, I've known you what now for about a dozen years, yeah. I think. And I've at seen least. your work and at least, yeah. And I adore your work. And um, so you were at it before your son was born and quite likely while he was an infant, etc. Yeah. Well, I thought I would just pop on here in the last couple of minutes, um, just for a couple of questions. If anyone has a question um, for Ursula and Vanessa, please drop it down below by clicking ask a question. Um, so I want to know, did the pandemic um, make you want to write more or did it kind of, um, you know, make you, uh, you know, not? Did you feel less creative, more creative? Either mm. How about you? Vanessa. I, 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 I could barely even read for pleasure. I did nothing for months. I, yeah. you know, it was such like a, it was so surreal. And I know that word is so overused, but I could not even focus on books. It felt like once I started to come out of it, it felt like almost I was starting all over <laughs> again um, as a reader and as a writer. It was just, it wasn't good for me. I know some people flourished and, you know, agents were swamped with queries because all these people wrote pandemic novels and God bless, but I could not do a thing. Mm -hmm. I found it very difficult to, to write. Yeah, I did a lot of reading, um, but the writing was difficult. And I'm just now in the last month or so getting back into my into my pattern of writing, into um, thinking about it um, while I'm walking and think, okay, I want to get home, work on this, or getting up early, setting the alarm early so I can write. And, um, you know, at this age now, um, I have a lot more time. I just retired from Stony Brook. So the writing is the full time thing. And my husband is an artist and our kids are grown. So in terms of transition time, there is so much more than when I was your age, Vanessa. And um, I guess I'll finish with this question. <laughs> what is, um, what are you reading right now? Like what, um, what book would you recommend that you're reading? I finished Hamnet um, recently by Maggie O'Farrell. It's, it's incredible. It's set in Shakespeare's time, and it is based on Shakespeare's laws of his son and uh, the plague. And, um, you know, it's fictionalized. There are other things happening, but the, um, especially the emotional landscape, I, I didn't have to do any crossing over. It was all inside me. Um, and sometimes with novels that are set in a different time period, um, I have to work at crossing over into that time. And here it was, it was there. I recommend it. Wow. Okay. All right. And uh, Vanessa, what are you reading? Um, I just, just uh, started, uh, No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood, um, which is strange and um, really neat. And I'm not far enough into it yet, uh, but um, 
it seems like it's right up my alley because it's a little bit weird and that's like what I like. So <laughs> a little bit weird is good. I like that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that too. Yeah. 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 So I'll let you. Yeah. I, yeah. I just actually started reading a, a little bit of a weird book myself. I'm, I picked up, um, it's called night bitch by oh my uh, God, yes. Rachel Yoder. Yeah. It's about a woman who has a child and actually starts to imagine that she's turning into a dog and giving into her canine tendencies. So wow. it's a little weird, but yeah, it's weird. is good. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's on my list. <laughs> I recommend. Um, all right. Well, I think that that's pretty much all uh, the time that we have for tonight. So I want to thank you so much, Ursula and Vanessa, for uh, participating in Right America. You're very welcome. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Lauren, you're a little um, bit frozen. Oh, shoot. Um, hmm, maybe my Wi-Fi might have kicked out. Um, but at any rate, I hope that you can join us next week, um, next Monday for Write America with authors uh, Jamal May and Lindsay Adkins. So we will see you then. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.